Uh, today we have the topic um, of our second rectifier webinar series and uh, the importance of power rectifiers in fast switching applications and before we will have a short look on today's agenda I would like to take the opportunity to again introduce today's presenters to you. Um, so yeah, as Anna introduced myself already, my name is Ole Thomsen. I'm working as a product manager for Nexperia uh, and I focus on the portfolio management of our rectifiers. Then we have Nima in the call. Nima is our product application engineer and he has a very strong focus on power products. And last but not least, uh, Juan is with us and Juan is our development engineer and currently he focuses on the development of short key rectifiers. So today's agenda, first of all, I would like to wrap up our first rectifier session, which took place in February this year, and before Huan will explain the switching principle of rectifiers, and he will also explain the reverse recovery effect. In chapter three, I would like to uh, define the switching parameters before Huan will compare different rectifiers with respect to switching parameters and in particular he will focus on the trend shot, shot key rectifier. In chapter 5 Nima will then show some dynamic application examples before we will benchmark various rectifiers in an application environment. Then uh, concluding the session in, in section 7 we will summarize the presentation and give also an outlook on the last upcoming webinar and then uh, we will open a Q&A session. So let's start with the recap session. Um, the first rectifier webinar uh, focused on the rectifier principles. Therefore, we have introduced the basic PN junction and uh, explained it on an atomic level. And we have also explained, for instance, how the depletion region comes about. Then we have um, used simplified cross sections of the different rectifiers uh, to compare the technologies. And you could really see that uh, the different atomic structure was leading to different diet character characteristics. And then we have um, shown the rectifier portfolio across the um, reverse voltage range. And here we have our Schottky rectifiers going up to 200 volt, um, silicon germanium also up to 200 volt, between 100 and 200 volt, bridging the gap between Schottky and recovery rectifiers. Uh, and then also silicon carbide in the uh, high voltage area. Um, then we have shown a short movie which illustrated the quite complex uh, manufacturing process of rectifiers before we have then introduced a very characteristical ID curve of a rectifier. Uh, and in the first session, we have focused very much on static parameters. Therefore, uh, the main um, parameters like VF in the forward direction or the reverse leakage currents in the, the uh, reverse directions were introduced. We have then used um, reverse polarity protection application to benchmark the different rectifier technologies um, with respect to the VF and the IR. Uh, we did that at room temperatures and also at elevated temperatures at 125 degrees C. And in the efficiency benchmarking, we have checked the forward power loss. And there we have seen that the most promising device for that application is the planar low VF short key rectifier. And with that, I would like to hand over to Vaughan. All right, so thank you, Ola. So I will talk about uh, rectifier switching and reverse recovery effect. So basically, we want to understand in this session um, how the diode uh, behaves if uh, we turn the diode on. So basically, uh, enable a forward direction um, current flow. And especially, we want to understand how the diode behaves if uh, we switch them. So basically, turn uh, from forward direction to uh, backward direction in blocking state. So basically, we want to understand how the dynamic behavior of uh, this kind of diode uh, rectifiers are. To understand this, we need to uh, take care that we uh, understand uh, the principles of carrier transport in those kind of, of um, 
uh, diets. And uh, speaking of carrier transport, we can distinguish between two fundamental kind of transport, between unipolar transport and between uh, bipolar transport. Um, let's focus first on unipolar transport. So as the name suggests, unipolar transport, uh, just one carrier type uh, contributes to electrical current. And uh, to enable such a device, uh, uh, we can just take a Schottky diode. So basically a metal semiconductor device. So put a Schottky metal on top of a doped semiconductor and we already have a, a, a unipolar transport device. Um, typically we use uh, N-type silicon, low dope N-type silicon and put a Schottky metal on top such that we allow electrons uh, to carry the current and uh, ultimately just determine the behavior of those kinds of devices, those kinds of short key diodes. Um, in contrast to that, we have the bipolar transport. And also here, as the name suggests, uh, we have now two kinds of um, carrier types contributing to the electrical current. And here also we have a, a prominent candidate. Uh, this is the PN diode, so where we basically uh, have a P-type uh, semiconductor on top of an N-type semiconductor. And here uh, we allow electron and holes to carry simultaneously the current. That's why the name given bipolar transport. Um, if we recall uh, our learnings from the first session, we already know that those kind of um, structure, so metal semiconductor and semiconductor semiconductor enables short key diodes and uh, PN diodes respectively, and also determines how their static behavior is. So how their VF, their voltage drop, forward voltage drop is, how their breakdown voltage is, how their leakage current is. But we can also now link this, those kind of structures to their transport characteristics. So again, short key diodes are somehow corresponding to unipolar transport and PN diodes are somehow correlated to bipolar transport. And this kind of uh, correlation is important to understand uh, if we have switching applications uh, or dynamic uh, behavior of those kinds of, of diets. To really understand this more, to really understand how the how this charge carriers behave in such devices, we need to take a deeper look. And therefore we need to take a look at the so-called band structure of those kind of uh, devices. So let's, for, let's again start with the unipolar device. So basically the Schottky diode. Uh, you see in the center of this um, of this slide the so-called band diagram. So band diagram plots the energy level of charge carriers against a, a coordinate, and uh, this band diagram is, uh, is is drawn such that on the left hand side we have the metal, on the right hand side we have the N semiconductor, and um, this both uh, um, materials are already brought into contact. Uh, so we already have this characteristic band bending of the N semiconductor. And what you can already see also in this graph is that this device is already biased in forward direction. So you can see this by this lifted um, um, lines, uh, which is correlated to the so-called Fermi level. Uh, by biasing this uh, diode in forward direction, we just allow that the current can flow. And we know that uh, for Schottky diodes, it's a unipolar transport device. We know that uh, uh, that one carrier type is contributing to that. And in that case, it's the electrons, which uh, are now depicted in, in as blue um, circuits here. And we see that uh, by biasing this diode, we allow the, the sort of say, the electrons moving from the end semiconductor to the metal. Um, from this graph, you already see that to enable this kind of, of forward current flow, we don't need to store a lot of uh, charge carriers, basically really no uh, uh, charge carriers uh, into any kind of junction in to enable this kind of uh, flow. We just need to um, exceed some some kind of threshold voltage and then the current will flow. And this threshold voltage typically is in the range of 0.2 to 0.4 uh, uh, volt as stated here. So here, important message, yes, we just need uh, to, uh, to, to forward bias the device and we don't need to extra store some minority charge carriers into this device to enable the current to flow. If we now have a look at the bipolar uh, transport device, so a PN junction, uh, we can yeah, just uh, 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 look at the same uh, principle. So again, we uh, can draw the so-called band diagram. Here now we have the P semiconductor on the left-hand side and the N semiconductor on the right-hand side. And already here also, we already uh, plotted this device in, in forward bias. So again, this so-called Fermi level is already lifted and we already have current 
uh, flows into, so to say, uh, opposite uh, um, um, regime. So we already have some electrons in the p region and uh, the elect and holes in the n region. And this is needed because uh, we learned, for, we know from the first session that we need to um, uh, make the depletion region, which is formed by the p-n junk itself, to be vanished in order to make the current uh, flow to happen. That means that we need to store some minority charge carriers in the system to enable um, the current to flow. And typically, uh, this is achieved by uh, uh, if we raise uh, the threshold voltage of around 0.5 volts. And this is a main, um, let's say, uh, um, a factor wh where you can divide unipolar and, and bipolar transport. In bipolar transport, you need some kind of, or there is some stored minority charge carriers in the system as soon as we forward biasing the system. And now, if we want to reverse bias the system, so to say a, a trigger is switching event, we now need to take care how we can handle this kind of minority charge carriers, especially for the bipolar transport. And to understand this more, let's now focus in more on this kind of behavior. What you can now see in this slide is that on the, on the top right, you see a time evolution of the forward current and the uh, forward voltage plotted. And on the bottom, you see um, a, a charge carrier density graph. So what you see here is how are the charge carriers in the N minus layer uh, yeah, distributed? Uh, so basically, how is the depletion region flooded with ex exceeded charge carriers? So in the state one, uh, we enabled the forward of, uh, uh, forward mode. So to say, we already flood the, the the region with excess charge carrier. That's why in the in the picture at the bottom you see that there are some charge carriers left. And now we want to trigger the diode to be uh, to be in blocking mode. So what we need to enable is we need to build up again this depletion region or this base charge region. And to, to, by doing so, uh, we, we need to um, remove all the excess charge carriers. So in the state two, you already see that some charge carriers are removed, but still the, the diode is, is still in the forward direction, so to say. There's still um, a forward uh, voltage to be measured. Uh, as soon as we removed enough charge carriers um, uh, from the from the depletion region, the the yeah the depletion region itself forms. So the the sp space charge region forms uh, marked here as WSC, and here we enter the blocking state, and uh, we need a certain width of this uh, layer and to really enable the full blocking mode of the diode, and this is given by the state. And if we now take the whole picture and have uh, 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 and want to judge uh, the, the really the, the time critical um, uh, effects here is that really the time needed to extract all the ex excess charge carriers is determining determining the, the switching behavior of, of a PN uh, diode. And especially since the PN diode also have minority charge carriers, which are basically holes. Uh, they need a, a lot of time uh, to be extracted from this um, from this uh, from this n minus layer, and this leads that in principle, if you have a pure p-n junction, uh, to very long switching times in a, in a range of microseconds. However, you can uh, do uh, additional measures, additional uh, structures to uh, to enhance this kind of extraction uh, and uh, enable yeah faster switching for p-n. But however. PN diodes will always suffer uh, of this effect that yeah you have somehow ex uh, excess charge carriers which need to be extracted from the junction uh, in order to establish the blocking mode. With this said, I would uh, hand over back to Ole, uh, who is uh, yeah, explaining a little bit the switching behavior definition. Right, so yeah, basically there are two switching events in a rectifier. The first one is the turn on event. This is the event when the diode becomes conductive and this is uh, called the forward recovery effect. And in the end, this is the time required until the drift zone becomes flooded with charge carriers. And in the graphic, we can see that uh, there is a linear increase of the current until the maximum forward current is reached. But at the same time, and there is a voltage overshoot, um, the so-called dynamic peak forward voltage drop, the VFRM. Um, 
And the reason for that um, is that the drift zone does not yet have the necessary conductivity. Uh, and in the beginning, it's, it's high ohmic and it requires a certain period of time um, until the charge carriers are entering the drift zone until the layer becomes then low ohmic. Um, yeah, in general, uh, the forward recovery effect plays a minor role in switching applications, but I wanted to mention it here for the sake of completeness. Uh, and Nima will pick this topic up later again uh, and, and compare both switching effects and put them in, in contrast. And yeah, more important, the reverse recovery effect. Um, this is the event when the diet goes into blocking mode. And uh, you can see that the current uh, starting from the forward current IF um, ramps down with a certain DIDT and the current through the diode even passes the zero line and becomes negative. And also that is due to the excess charge carriers as Juan mentioned before. Uh, I would like now to define two very important parameters in the switching event. The first one is the TRR, the reverse recovery time. And this is being defined as the time between the first zero crossing and 20% of the peak reverse current, the IRM value. And the second one is the QRR, the so-called reverse recovery charge. And this, sorry, this one corresponds to the area below the horizontal line uh, and can be understood as the integral of the current uh, over the TRR. And this is how it usually is defined in the data sheet, but we also have to distinguish between the QRR from the data sheet and the QRR in a real application. And this would be the QRR uh, which arises in a real application. So in case there is a tail current, also this additional charge uh, needs to be switched and therefore would also or needs to be considered in an application environment. And in general, it can be said that uh, the reverse recovery charge is the essential parameter for switching power loss. Okay, so I will again take over and, and now let's uh, have a more detailed look about a different kind of rectifier. So before we we, we just uh, have a look on, let's say, very theoretical uh, PN junctions and metal semiconductor junctions, but how does this uh, been realized in, so to say, real world? So let's take a first look at cotton recovery rectifier. We already know that this is a PN uh, a diode, so to say. We know that uh, this is a bipolar characteristic, so it somehow suffer from a lot of uh, excess charge carriers, needs, uh, which needs to be extracted. Uh, in the junction and to enable a switching event. Uh, and uh, here in this sketch, you see how in reality this kind of device is terminated because this, um, uh, the, the, at the end of the device, you need to somehow uh, enable or uh, that, in, that no uh, high electric field arise. So uh, basically, yeah, just to terminate the field. And for PN rectifiers, there are, diff there are a lot of concepts, but in general, you somehow just try to field relieve uh, the, the electrical field uh, on these edges with uh, uh, geometric approaches like field plates, floating termination rings or JTEs. Fundamentally, you just uh, need additional dye area. We know that PN rectifiers just uh, are, are inferior in terms of switching just because they're bipolar in nature. So if we now would take the Schottky diode as a, in principle, unipolar device, we would argue that maybe we, we uh, yeah, this would be much better. It is, but you can see already from the sketch, right, uh, that although we have a, a, a metal semiconductor layer, we also need to terminate this, this, uh, this diode. And this is done by a so-called guard ring. And as the, the sketch suggests, the, the guard ring itself is again a PN uh, diode. So what we have in, in especially high power Schottky diodes, we need a, a, a PN diode uh, in parallel to the Schottky diode in order to control the diode's breakdown and also to, yeah, to stabilize the, uh, the breakdown behavior of Schottky diodes. This additional PN diode needs to be switched. So suffer from the same bipolar nature as uh, a, 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 a standard PN rectifier. That's why normally planar Schottky diodes are 
better, but still uh, not as, as good as, so to say, a pure unipolar device. And with this set, uh, now comes the, 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 the trench geometry interplay. So for trench short keys, we can now omit this kind of parasitic PN diet uh, by etching trenches into the silicon, fill this up with uh, 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 conducting material, and somehow get rid of this parasitic PN diet. Basically, what this means is by using trench stru structures as termination uh, approach, uh, we can uh, just yeah have a purely unipolar device. The trench itself also enables additional uh, benefits, uh, especially we can yeah tune even more the properties of the diet, and this is what I want to highlight in the next slide. Uh, so in this slide, uh, you see on the left the planar short key and the right the trench short key. Uh, important in this uh, in this sketches you see is that here we draw the equipotential lines, so the parallel lines you see in the in the sketches. And we know that the gradient of the potential is the E field. That means that uh, if the potential lines are crowded, we have a high electric field. And if you now look at the planar shock key, we see that especially at the interface or in the surface region between the metal and the semiconductor, we just have uh, a lot of potential lines. So here we, we, we expect a very high electric field. This will result that, in general, the planar shot key cannot uh, withstand a lot of, uh, of, uh, of, of voltage, so to say, and also have increased leakage. Uh, and with trenches, which you can see on the right-hand side, you can um, tune this kind of potential line. So how does the trenches are built? So as I said, we etch into the silicon, we fill this up with uh, insulating material, silicon dioxide, and fill it again with um, conducting material, in that case it's polysilicon, and the polysilicon is connected to the top contact of the, of, the, of the diet, so it's the same potential there. What this enables is that, as you can see on the, uh, on the sketches, that the EP potential lines are very well distributed in the whole uh, uh, drift region. It means that we can just, by, by using this kind of trenches, um, have uh, higher breakdown uh, voltages and also have lower leakages. So basically, uh, by using this, we can yeah, have more parameters to tune. So this effect to, to the, let's say, uh, reduce the surface field is called also called resurface effect. And as I mentioned, this will enable increased uh, uh, breakdown voltage, reduce leakage current, and we can tune even more the parameters. And as I mentioned before, we can get rid of the PN diode as a, as a termination strategy for planar short keys which will indeed uh, uh, yeah, enhance the switching behavior of, of the short key diet. And as the last slide, uh, let's have a more detailed look again at the trend short keys. So what you see here on this slide is the SCM picture of a real device. And uh, uh, you can draw a, um, you can draw an equivalent uh, diagram for those kind of uh, uh, structures. You, so you, what you see in the middle, so you have the, the diet, you have the, capacitance connected to the diet, you have the uh, resistance connected to the drift. With the trenches, you add a parallel um, resistance for the trench and also a capacitance for the trench. Um, however, this additional parasitic capacitance does not have any influence on, on, uh, on the switching and also not on electromagnetic inter uh, interference. And in fact, the trench short key is uh, really uh, superior um, compared to the planar short key if we look at switching applications. And speaking about switching applications, I will now hand over to Nima. We'll, uh, he will guide us through uh, yeah, some examples and uh, explain why really trenches are uh, superior. Thank you, Juan. Um, yeah, and now this leaves the question open, how these differences between the technologies are reflected uh, in real life applications. Um, so let's start where we left off in the last session. Um, we left off at this slide showing types of uh, dynamic applications uh, where diets are used. And today we are going to focus on hard switching applications like the buck converter or the boost converter, um, uh, or in this case, a flyback converter. Um, these 
uh, applications both, uh, as I mentioned last time, contain the, let's call it, basic switching cell. So a combination of an inductor, um, a power switch, in this case MOSFET, uh, and a diode. Uh, this basic switching cell is directly influenced by the reverse recovery effect of the diode. So um, the parameters which were introduced by Ole um, directly have an effect on the turn on and uh, off losses of these uh, of these converters. And um, before we go on, um, let's maybe look at um, where we in which kind of application topologies we can find these basic switching cells because it's not only in the bug and boost stages, uh, which we find in, for example, e-bike applications to provide multiple voltage levels. Um, we also find them in, uh, in the boost PFC or in three level inverters. Um, the first one is uh, often used in, 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 uh, in solar applications. The last one often used as a traction inverter um, for, for cars. Um, and we have also some more complex examples like the, the totem pole and the LLC resonant, um, where a combination of those two is often used uh, in uninterruptible power supplies. Maybe a small side note, the uh, LLC resonant uh, topology is typically uh, a soft switch application where you do not suffer that much from, or you don't suffer from reverse recovery losses. But what I want to emphasize with this slide is that you can see here we have different types of, um, of, of uh, topologies, but in the end it comes down to the base to understanding this basic switching cell. And for us to do that today, we will focus on the buck converter on the top left. And um, if we understand how the reverse recovery effect is, uh, is affecting the, the the application, and then we will understand it as well for the other topologies. So moving on, um, let's look. Let's take a closer look at the basic switching cell in a buck converter. So the basic principle of a buck converter is often known. Um, so you periodically switch on and off the transistor uh, at a given frequency, and the duty cycle. Uh, dictates the ratio between the input and the output voltage. So of course, this is only valid for the input voltage being bigger than the output voltage and for continuous conduction mode. Um, then to look at the, uh, let's look at the idealized uh, inductor current over time. Um, so, when we switch on the transistor, energy is stored in the magnetic field of the, of the inductor, and this causes the current to rise. Then we switch off the transistor, and we have the current commutating from the transistor to the diode, which uh, will cause forward recovery loss. After this commutation has happened, um, the diode is in free fully freewheeling operation and the uh, stored uh, magnetic energy is then, lean, is then decreasing and this will cause the inductor current to linear decrease. At the end of the cycle, the transistor again turns on and we again have the current to commutate now from the diode to the transistor. And this event now carries periodically on over time. Uh, if we look, take a closer look at one period of this, uh, of this uh, periodic event, um, and then take a look at the loss mechanisms, then we can see here that while the transistor is on, it suffers from conduction loss, which is equal to the current through the transistor times the RDS on. In the 
in the period uh, where the diode is conducting for the transistor is off, the diode, of course, suffers from conduction loss, which is equal to the average current times the forward voltage plus um, the sum pl plus the product of the uh, diode root mean square current um, squared times the differential resistor. Now, at the point where the current is commutating from the um, from the diode to the transistor, we will have the reverse recovery loss. And here we see again the idealized waveforms for the reverse recovery loss. Um, now, to to understand the the loss mechanisms, let's select. Um, Let's select some, uh, some diet technologies from the next period portfolio and then use them to benchmark the technology for a real life buck converter. For this, we start, um, we start uh, selecting diets for a 48 volt buck converter. Um, and here I would propose that we choose a uh, voltage class uh, in the range of 100 to 200 volts so we have enough safety margin um, to uh, to survive transient events uh, during the application of course we then have uh, to look at the vf uh, reverse recovery time temperature and for this we have um, drawn technology map um, for uh, reverse recovery time over the forward voltage drop for this given operation point of 48 volts, uh, blocking voltage, 3 amp uh, forward current, and uh, DIFTT of one minus 1 amp per nanosecond. Our devices which we want to investigate um, are two short feed technologies. We have one trench diet, 100 volt 3 amp, which is the PMEC 100 T30. We have the planar 100 volt 3 amp shot key, which is the PMEC 130. And we have a silicon germanium type, uh, which is a 120 volt 3 amp device. And we have the hyperfast uh, 200 volt 3 amp PN diode. And um, as we can see here in the, in the technology map, the um, which actually um, agrees with what Juan just said, Short key diets have low forward voltage and small reverse recovery time um, because they are unipolar devices. And uh, the PN diet has the highest forward voltage drop and the highest recovery time. And even over temperature, um, the, uh, nothing unexpected happens. So the forward voltage drop um, decreases for all the technologies and the reverse recovery time increases for also for all technologies. Um, we learned that the, that the conduction loss is determined by the forward voltage drop. Um, we can adjust uh, our formula, which we have learned if we don't uh, have ripple or if we neglect the ripple on the uh, diet voltage waveform. So, um, so then let's have a look how we can uh, measure and quantify the reverse recovery of these technologies. For this, we use the double pulse test setup, which is depicted uh, in the bottom left corner. Um, and if you recall the buck converter schematic and imagine that you remove the output capacitors, short the output, um, and add a, a shunt resistor to measure the diode current, then you have exactly uh, use the same the same uh, application and the benefit of the double pulse test is that you that the, the the reverse recovery charge that you measure um, is exactly for your application so all the um, all the uh, parasitic effects are reflected in, in your values um, for those of you who are not familiar with the double pulse so you um, through the MOSFET, um, you you store again um, energy in the magnetic field, 
switch it off and then you have the reverse recovery commutation uh, uh, you have the current then commutating from the uh, diode to the transistor and then you can measure the reverse recovery by adjusting um, t1 uh, you can set the forward current and by adjusting uh, the, the gate resistance you can then set the desired DIFTT. So let's recall the um, let's recall the, the, the idealized waveforms. Um, here again, I put uh, the factor, the parameters which is uh, which is um, from which is QR dependent, and the pet rule parameters are dedicated by the uh, applications, and the orange uh, parameters are given by the device. Um, so let's look um, where QRR actually uh, does in fact losses. So in the section between T2 and T3, um, the diode is still conducting. So the only loss um, the uh, QRR is inflecting is in the MOSFET because it's still carrying the full DC blocking voltage. In the next part between T3 and T4, then the peak, IR, uh, peak reverse current has been reached. And now the diode uh, starts to build up the space charge region and will also suffer losses. But at the same time, at uh, T3, the MOSFET has to carry the additional uh, peak reverse current. So we can see here that the QRR also induces losses, major, the QR majorly induces losses into the MOSFET. So how does this look for our for our uh, four technologies? Um, but before we do that, maybe I quickly show you an oscilloscope screenshot of the double pulse. In red, you have the reverse voltage. In blue, you have the forward current, and in green, you have the inductor current. We are now mainly interested on the point where the red curve and the blue curve overlap. I mark them here. The blue rectangles um, indicate where we have losses due to forward recovery and the yellow one where we have losses due to reverse recovery. And what we can see here that uh, forward recovery is, the losses due to forward recovery is uh, small compared to reverse recovery, which is why we only focus on reverse recovery. So let's look on the reverse recovery, so the yellow rectangle which we just saw, for our four devices which we used. Um, here we have a double y-axis plot. Uh, the dotted dashed lines are the, volt the reverse voltages of the technologies belonging to the left y-axis. The, the, uh, the solid lines belong to the to the right axis, and we have in, in petrol the the planar device. We have in orange the trench device. We have in the light blue color the silicon germanium device, and the, the purple color indicates the uh, PN rectifier. What we can see here is that the reverse recovery waveforms from the current for all technologies look the same, except at the end, the, the PN rectifier recovers uh, more softer. Um, additionally, we can see here that the Schottky technologies um, have a smaller reverse recovery compared to the other ones. And we also can see that what we explained in theory, that the current, uh, that the voltage starts to rise once the peak reverse uh, current is reached is also reflected in our measurement results. Um, how does this change with over temperature? So we used the same technologies and looked at 100 degrees. And we can see here that all the values um, increased by a factor. So for our next, uh, for the next step, we only focus on the Schottky technologies because they show the most promising uh, 
because they have the lowest effect, the lowest reversal recovery effect. So to summarize, the Shotty technology has the smallest IRM, QR, and TRR. The PN diet has a softer recovery at the end compared to other technologies. And uh, temp when the, if the temperature rises, all the uh, values increase. So moving on, we now we now look uh, at different operation conditions. So we um, in, in a buck converter, you don't have always your three ampere. So you have also low load conditions, for example, one ampere, and you have high load conditions. We need to switch off more load. Um, and this is what we tried to, uh, to, to distinguish with this experiment. So the dashed lines show um, a forward current of 6 ampere, the dotted lines for 1 ampere, and the solid lines the 3 ampere, which we do, just saw. Again, we are now looking at the orange curves for the trench and uh, the petrol ones for the planar device. And we can see that the uh, the trench device is not affected or not much affected or not visibly affected by the forward current. Um, the planar device has the more spread in the reverse recovery charge. And we took it a step further. We wanted to see if this benefit also holds for bigger crystal sizes. So we did the same experiment and choose um, a 10 ampere 100 volt trench again an orange and a 10 ampere planar device, again in petrol, and conducted double pulses at double the rated current and half the rated current. And also we can see here that the trench device shows uh, less variation with increasing or decreasing the uh, forward current. So to, summar to summarize, um, the influence on the forward current is small for trench devices. Um, planar shock keys show higher uh, IF dependency, and the advantage is also valid for larger dice sizes. And we wanted to test one more condition. We wanted to see how this effect, uh, how does it, if, if trench still has the advantage if we slower the um, the DIDT ramp, which would which, which we switch off. So this time we uh, depicted two operating points and we plotted the QRR over the DIDT. Again, on the left hand side for a 3 amp comparison, and again for the three different forward currents. And here we can see that the rise in, uh, in QRR. And the spread in QRR is very small for the 3 ampere trench device and very large for the planar device, 3 ampere planar device. If we look on the right hand side, um, we can see that the spread for the trench device gets also a little bigger. Um, and the spread for the uh, for the for the planar device is uh, approximately the same. Um, so what we can see is that uh, that the variation of DIFTT has a minor impact on the trench technology, um, and the variation of DIFTT and the forward current uh, has a, a higher impact on uh, bigger crystal sizes. And of course, if you now would increase the temperature, uh, all the values would increase. So how does this um, show itself in an application? For that, we use the same double pulse test platform and, uh, and, and, and reassembled it to be, again, a buck converter. So remove the shunt, uh, added some output capacitors. And then on the left-hand side, you can see uh, the setup which we have used. So a little bit more complex than the double pulse test setup. Maybe before going on to the result, uh, one remark, the efficiency is defined as uh, the output power divided by the input, input power, but we do not consider driver losses. 
Okay, and uh, before showing the, the, the complete um, the complete uh, uh, results, maybe also that only to highlight the, if you if you draw a, a pie chart of uh, of the complete losses of the bulk converter, the majority of losses happen due to conduction losses. So the conduction loss of the MOSFET, conduction loss of the diet, inductor, and so on. And the switching losses uh, are, play a, a smaller role. And the, this is this hold for our example for 48 volt to 12 volt converter. And the reverse recovery, uh, the loss due to reverse recovery, play a certain role in the switching roles uh, in the switching losses. And with today's results, we are targeting that uh, yellow marked area. So let's look at the uh, at the results. Uh, for this, and we used uh, the 48 volt to 12 volt bulk converter. We compared the 100 volt trench 10 ampere device to the 100 volt uh, planar 10 ampere device, and we plotted the difference in efficiency of the uh, of the bulk converter using the trench. Uh, and the buck converter using the planar. So what you can see here on the y-axis is the delta efficiency uh, of the buck converter using both um, technologies. And the positive value indicates that the trench um, efficiency was higher. Um, okay, uh, now we have done this experiment at 5 ampere load current and 10 ampere load current for 250 kilohertz and 500 kilohertz. And we can see here that the trench diet has always a, a, a higher efficiency than the planar one. And the efficiency difference is highest for 500 kilohertz and 10 ampere. So what we saw here is that the reverse recovery, that the difference in reverse recovery has only effect on the turn on and turn off losses, not on the conduction losses. So from, from the VF point of view, both technolo technologies were in the same area for this parameter. So it's all, so this results that we always need to consider the, uh, the figure of merit uh, forward voltage drop times uh, reverse recovery. Um, and it also indicates that we already have looked at a really optimized system and we all we tried really to get the last last one percent in efficiency by just changing the diet. So we did not touch the layout. We just changed we just choose the right diet technology and could get nearly up to one percent in efficiency. And this we get um, due to the fact that trench has an uh, advantage over planar shot keys. And if we operate the, the platform in optimum condition, then we can see with a 10 ampere trench device, we can reach up to 95% in efficiency. Yeah, with that being said, uh, I would like to hand back to Ole, who will summarize this whole talk. Right, just um, a short remark, just in case you would to uh, further dive into the whole diet topic, uh, you can download um, or order a copy of our diet application handbook, which has been released last year. Uh, and now the short summary. Uh, in the beginning, Juan um, explained that the unipolar charge carrier transport is yeah, much faster than the bipolar charge carrier transport. And therefore, uh, we've seen and learned that the trench shot key rectifiers are purely unipolar um, devices, and therefore they are the ideal choice for switching applications. We've also learned a lot about the reverse recovery effect and that uh, this effect is essential for switching losses. And uh, just on the last slide, uh, Nima explained um, how conduction losses and switching losses affect the efficiency of the converter uh, and the figure of merit should be uh, considered for that. 
just a sneak peek on the upcoming webinar. Um, the third session of the Rectifier webinar will take place in November. And there we will have the topic, the secret of efficient and compact clip bonded flat power packages. And in that session, um, yeah, we will explain the basic uh, RTH concept. We will introduce different power rectifier packages and we will we'll give some guidelines on designs and how to optimize um, the thermal design. And last but not least, uh, it's also the, the aim or the goal to uh, benchmark different rectifier packages with respect to performance. Yeah, and with that, I would like to open the Q&A session and I would like to encourage you, in case you have any open questions, please feel free to type them into the control panel. Thank you.